Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. We were not planning on doing this, but with everything going on in Ottawa, we had to make a mention of the conservative leadership debacle changes, the ousting of Aaron O'Toole. And we put a call out on social media, like literally yesterday morning. And our two guests today are former guests of the show. And they jumped on and said, hey, we'll come on. I'm pleased to welcome former NDP MP for the riding of Scarborough Southwest, Dan Harris, and former MLA for Fort Saskatchewan, Vegreville, and former interim leader of the Alberta Party, Jackie Fenske. Dan, Jackie, thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. For us. Um, I, I, I guess we should just sort of do a preamble here. Uh, if anyone has not been paying attention to anything that's been going on in Ottawa in the last 12, 14, 24 hours, Aaron O'Toole is no longer the leader of the Conservative Party. After Monday's sort of midnight posting from Bob Benzer, the MP for Calgary Heritage, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, said that he wants a leadership review of Aaron O'Toole. The party started circling the carcass and Aaron O'Toole was voted out yesterday. That's Wednesday the 2nd. By 73 to 45 MPs voting against Aaron O'Toole's leadership. Uh, I, I will start the questioning off in this generic way as possible. And I'll start with Dan because you, you, you've sat across from Aaron O'Toole in the House of Commons. Were you shocked at what happened uh, Wednesday morning? I, I can't really say that I am. Uh, because uh, Aaron's leadership has kind of been hanging by a thread for a while. Uh, and it's been quite clear in Ottawa that uh, for months that there's parts of the caucus that have not been happy uh, with the leadership. Of course, lots of conservatives are not happy with the election results. Everybody thought, you know, like, you know, Trudeau uh, was on the downward slide. And, uh, you know, I mean, Aaron's best polling numbers were, you know, two weeks into the election campaign. Uh, and uh, it all went south from there. Uh, of course, I mean, both the Liberals and Conservatives managed to, to lose a million votes between them in the last election, uh, but Justin Trudeau managed to actually come out with more seats, uh, whereas the Conservatives uh, lost a couple. So, you know, uh, I don't think people saw that as a step forward. Uh, and of course, Aaron also uh, tried some things that were a little different from what uh, Andrew Scheer had done. Uh, and tried to maybe pull the party back into what most would consider the mainstream. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's large segments of the Conservative Party that were not happy with that, just like in the NDP, if the people try to pull things a little more to the center, there's lots of people on the left that aren't happy with that. Uh, meanwhile, it just leads to the Liberals gobbling up everybody's lunch. Now, Jackie, you and I are both here in Alberta, sort of the hub of the conservative support. In the last election, we uh, the conservatives did lose three seats, one to the uh, NDP and two to the uh, Liberal Party. The sort of the caucus revolt started coming in from the Alberta wing of the party. Were conservatives out here in Alberta, and particularly Western conservatives, just upset of how Aaron O'Toole was bringing the party more to the center compared to Andrew Scheer, Stephen Harper? Well, I, I don't think they had much to worry about because you just had to say you were running under the conservative banner and you, you, you got elected. Uh, but I think because of all of the different factions of the party, and it's hard to be that big tent party across this huge nation, that they didn't get all of... Um, I guess the attention uh, that they wanted and, you know, in politics, you got to have a bit of an ego too. So um, things happened. Uh, Aaron, I would say was trying to show his uh, command of the caucus and uh, did things like, uh, you know, Shannon Stubbs, the, the most winnable riding uh, for a conservative in the entire country uh, took away all of her, um, all of her committees, I believe, and uh, basically neutered her. Uh, unfortunately, as a woman, I'm going, why did you choose a woman? But of course, it was that particular riding. And I would say that some of the others probably had some of the same fate, but just a little quieter, like uh, Nathan Cooper or Garna Genius. And uh, uh, they weren't happy because they wanted the limelight. Uh, Denise Batters, uh, Senator Batters would be another example uh, uh, as well. Yeah, so, that's right. 
it opens up the question of is the conservative party a truly unified party because you look at what Stephen Harper did, bringing the reforms, the Canadian Alliance, whatever they were called at the time, and the progressive conservatives together under his leadership, and he was able to form a coalition to win. Has the Conservative Party of 2004-2006, when Stephen Harper started the party, sort of disbanded it because of the rise of parties like the People's Party of Canada, the Maverick Party? And I'll start with Jackie on this one. Uh, is is the Conservative Party, can it be unified again, or are we destined to have a divided right like we did in the 1990s? Well, I think it's going to be unified to try to win the election because, you know, uh, winning the election gives you some power. But it, it can't. Um, you know, the best scenario, and I'm sure we've heard heard of this even prior to the last election, uh, that you would probably see the conservative movement across this country to be a series of regional uh, conservative groups, the Maverick Party uh, in Alberta, and, and acting as a coalition uh, should they form government in Canada, because they, it's just being become impossible to meet the expectations uh, of the different regions. So will so it be... Yeah, I, I don't think it can possibly continue to exist uh, as a unified party. Where do the the sort of middle of the road voices like Matt Jenner, where where do they find a home? Uh, if um, if the party goes to where we would expect it to be, because they're trying to to get back some of those uh, PPC uh, voters, uh, they have to move significantly to the right, and you're going to lose the more moderate because there's just no home for them then. Which uh, is interesting because Aaron O'Toole won that leadership, same sort of boasting that he could bring the center back to the party, win the GTA, which is a key win for any party to win a majority or even a minority government, win areas in Quebec, win lower mainland BC. Now, I, 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 I'm, I'm from a rural area. I literally was represented by Aaron O'Toole for a few years. Uh, Dan and I know each That's other. How we from, met. That's how Dan <laughs> and I met from that 2012 by-election under uh, Bev Oda and Aaron O'Toole. If the party goes more to the right, which it seems like the supporters of the party want it to, is the party destined to just be that rural party and they're just giving the NDP and the Liberals the... the the fight of the downtown cores of the city of Vancouver, Edmonton, even I say Edmonton, even though it's conservative, Toronto, Montreal, is the conservatives okay with just being the party of rural Canada? Dan? Uh, I, I don't think so because I think they do want to have power, uh, but I mean, it's, it's quite the square to circle these days uh, when you're looking at the di divergent opinions, uh, whether it be on social issues, whether it be on economic issues, uh, or I would say the, the bigger one, the environment, um, because you have, I think, the greatest divide uh, in conservative circles uh, on the environment uh, with respect to what we'd call mainstream uh, values or what uh, many Canadians want the government to be dealing with, uh, which is climate change. And, you know, in conservative circles, it's, it's kind of hard to even talk about climate change uh, because there's been very little in the way of positions and, uh, you know, really a strategy to tackle that. Uh, now, Aaron did win the leadership saying he was going to work on that and bring those over. And of course, after one election campaign in the middle of a pandemic, uh, that didn't happen and everybody's ready everybody was ready to jump uh, right away it's like well you said this would happen and it didn't um, but uh, we just have to look at the the new polls that just came out uh, from Angus Reid and one of the others uh, that showed that both the Liberals and Conservatives dropped five points in the last week uh, and four points went to the NDP five points went to the Greens and one to the PPC. And you have to think a lot of those conservative votes actually moved over to the Greens uh, because there is a large segment of the population that, uh, you know, within conservative circles that are economically conservative, but socially or environmentally more progressive. Uh, they believe in market solutions, but they think that the market solutions are going to actually help the environment. Uh, and a lot of them switch between the conservatives and the Greens. Uh, and, uh, you know, with Aaron's ouster and with everything going on in Ottawa, I think they just lost all those voters and 
unless they make some big work to bring them back, uh, they're probably going to be gone for a while. Now, I, I want to talk about Aaron O'Toole's sort of the, the, the caucus meeting today. We have someone on the show right now who has been in that position herself under Allison Redford. Jackie was an MLA during the Redford years, and she was there, I'm assuming, in that caucus meeting. And I know there's caucus confidentiality, but I will ask this anyway. Um, you were, you've been in the room before when you've had to confront a leader over their leadership. How hard is it for a sitting MLA or even MP to say, where you're taking this party is going to destroy us? you need to change course or you need to go. How hard is it as an MLA or an elected official to stand up to your party? Oh, it's, uh, you will get the, the lecture <laughs> of, you're not a, you know, party, party, um, a team where we're a team, we need each other, uh, divided, we fall, you, you get that all through all of that. And um, I mean, so, outside of caucus that, that whole start uh, thing started with a group of of mlas getting together in a meeting outside a uh, caucus uh, away from the legislature and even you know the discussion that ensued on that in that particular meeting was um it was difficult like you you don't do that that's that's not what you do in a party system and uh, so it requires <laughs> A, a bit of tenacity, you know, because it's just going against the against the the norm. Really, we're all supposed to support the leader, and there are times, though, in, in like in that case where the leader was out of step with the the people that voted us in, or as individual MLAs, our constituencies, and so where when do you stand up for your constituents versus the party? That's the big thing. And I think right now with the, the Conservative Party, uh, yes, some of them are hearing that's not the way we vote. Let's go back to my MP who happens to be Garnet. Um, and, uh, you know, Garnet has been pro, um, certainly has had a, a very so con stance on uh, conversion therapy, on uh, abortion rights. And then when the, his whole party voted to support the abolition of conversion therapy in Canada, uh, I can't see that being an easy thing for Garnet to take. So where, where do you get to have your say? Uh, and how do you ha get to say, have your say? Which brings up a good point. Aaron O'Toole kind of started throwing hail, hail Mary passes starting sort of Monday when the rumbling started after the convoy uh, uh, descended upon downtown, where he started attacking or people in his circle started attacking sitting members of parliament and members of his own caucus saying, the only reason people are upset be is, is because of that trans, uh, the conversion uh, ban that we did uh, unanimously pass. I've never seen a party leader actually attack their own MPs. Have you, Dan? It usually doesn't happen publicly. Well, uh, let's be honest. To, Everything to, happens to, publicly now. <laughs> yes. But what I'm saying is, it, I mean, parties and certainly leaders, because, you know, it's not just the leader. It's the leader's office. And when you're the leader of the official opposition, it's quite a large office and quite a large operation there that you can do a lot to kneecap individual members without ever saying anything publicly. Uh, so that sort of stuff usually happens first. But, you know, when a sitting MP or MLA, an elected official in your party, starts challenging you publicly, you have kind of two choices. You can sit there and take it, or you can smack them back. Uh, and, you know, I think Aaron decided that he wanted to try to, to smack them back. And given the position uh, that he saw that as being completely out of step with, again, sort of the mainstream, uh, that he thought that that would be uh, a vote getter uh, for him. Um, and I, you know, seeing social media today, uh, I saw Dan Albus, uh, one of the tweets that he sent out today uh, was, I've been asked a few times now what I think of Mr. O'Toole, that Mr. O'Toole brought to the party. In my view, he made our party more welcoming to those who had not felt as welcome in the past. This is a value I'll continue to support and fight for in the Conservative Party. Uh, and I think that's what Aaron tried to do. And I think there are certainly large elements in the Conservative Party that are resistant to that. 
um, you know, there are conservative values, there are NDP values, there are liberal values, and whenever a party strays away from that, uh, or leaders stray away from that, uh, there's always going to be a response from those that hold those values to heart. Uh, and, you know, I, I would say, when you look at since the 90s, you know, what would be called the progressive conservatives or the red Tories, whatever you want to call them, and the reform side of the party, you know, the progressive conservative side has been outnumbered the entire time. Um, you know, the grassroots of the reform party created uh, a movement that was filled with numbers uh, that I think have been able to generally outvote and overwhelm uh, what would be considered the progressive conservative wing of the party. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, what we've seen here is more evidence of that, because uh, it's certainly the caucus reflects that. Uh, and it's interesting to note, this is the first time that Michael Chong's bill uh, has been used uh, to great effect. And, you know, the NDP, who does its leaderships a little bit differently, uh, you know, voted in the last two parliaments not uh, to adhere to uh, Mr. Chong's bill. Uh, so our caucus members don't have the power to throw the leader out. That power resides with the membership. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Jackie, are the conservatives going through an identity crisis right now? Because we are seeing conservative movements, not even just here in Canada. Here in Alberta, we have a leadership review coming up for Jason Kenney. But even in the UK, under Boris Johnson, conservatives are getting hammered. And it it might be because of the vaccine mandate that a lot of people want to point to. And a lot of people are linking... He, uh, Aaron O'Toole's lack of cohesiveness around the issue of vaccine mandates and vaccines and opening up and letting people get back to uh, normal and his leadership. Are the conservatives going through an identity crisis right now where they don't know what they stand for and they're afraid to actually come together and say, this is what we stand for. Because right now we have a lot of different voices in the Conservative Party who say a lot of different things, and I don't know which one to actually believe and take their leadership seriously. Uh, well, I would, Ontario is a great example. Sorry, Jackie. Yeah. Well, I would, I would agree with you. They don't know which way because they want to, to regain that seat, uh, the power, right? And so they're probably willing to give a little bit in some ways, but it yes they they can't appease again we go back to you can't appease everybody that the tent is too big and um the i you know they've been that way since uh, the reform movement took over the party right some people left and others just have quietly sat there who were the the, the old pcs and i um i think that everybody's tired of trying to have to build bridges we, we don't have patience anymore so how do you win on that? How do you win when you don't build bridges, Jackie? Like, I just, I don't see a way forward because the names that are being floated around for a potential replacement for permanent leader of the Conservative Party, we won't even talk about interim leader because let's be honest, that job basically is the worst job you can have in any House of Commons because you have to try to build a party back together after leader has destroyed it. So how do you win when the names that have been floated around want to take the party and make it a small tent and say, this is the party that we are. This is what we stand for. Get on board or get out because that's what they kind of did with Aaron O'Toole. Well, they did. And they're not looking down the road. I mean, it's very short-sighted. It's, it's going to take care of an issue right now, but it's not going to get them elected. And um, they're going to lose lose as many people as they may think that they gain because I don't think that uh, Maxine Bernard is going to lose his PPC people no matter what uh, no matter how right the CPC goes yeah uh, do you have a follow-up on that Dan do you agree with that statement that Maxine Bernier and the whoever the next leader is is basically going to be fighting over 
I've I've actually heard some people say that Maxime Bernier should run for leader of the Conservative Party because he <laughs> might win it this time. No, uh, and I mean, he no. came he came he came within inches of winning last time. Uh, you know, if Andrew Shear hadn't have drunk a big you know chug some milk down, uh, it would have been Bernier that won. Um, but yes, I mean, in terms of building bridges, and I mean, you know, you have a Conservative Party right now that isn't welcoming to Joe Clark. Uh, and I think until you've got a conservative party that can attract Joe Clark back into its fold, uh, I think they're going to have difficulty winning. That being said, the conservative party did have one big thing going for it in the last two elections. They did get more votes than Justin Trudeau and the liberals, even though they didn't win more seats. And I think with what's going on now, uh, it's going to be very hard for them to win more votes than the Liberals do in the next election, uh, unless the Liberals reach that point of hubris that they tend to reach, which is when people go looking for Conservatives. Um, but I think we're still a, a ways off of that. Uh, we haven't seen the kind of arrogance uh, out of Justin Trudeau's Liberals that was displayed by the Creche Martin Liberals uh, in the last five years uh, of their governing. Uh, we see lots of errors and lots of fumbles and lots of mistakes happening, uh, but not the kind of hubris that we saw during that time when they, they saw themselves as invincible. Uh, and uh, until that happens, I don't think the Conservatives are going to be the option that everyone's looking for, unless they actually put forward someone that can attract enough people. Uh, and I don't think there's enough just on the right. Uh, you know, and this also could end up dragging the liberals a little bit more to the right as well, because they'll see an opening to attract some more votes from, you know, conservatives that are in not necessarily the the suburbs, but the suburbs of the cities. Uh, so places like Scarborough, which already elected six liberals. Uh, you know, there are lots of folks that will switch between liberals and conservatives there. And I think those folks are going to just stick with the liberals now. Uh, and it's going to make it harder for the conservatives to win those seats on the outer edges of the cities, let alone the actual suburbs around the cities. You bring up a good point, And I want to pose this to both of you here. And that is, this, could, this couldn't come at a worse time for the conservatives. Because you now have an official opposition who is kind of being neutered, using uh, <laughs> Jackie's word here around Shannon Stubbs, but they're now effectively leaderless because you're going to have a leadership campaign in the midst of a pandemic while we are battling inflation, while people are worried about feeding their families. Can... <laughs> Do they need to have a short leadership race or do they need to keep it long to ensure that we have the correct person? Because some people will look at that 2020 leadership race and say it was too short. Aaron O'Toole won because we didn't really know who Aaron O'Toole was. Do we need a long drawn out one to say, okay, this is the candidates, these are the candidates, and this is what they stand for and actually stands for instead of flip-flopping like Aaron O'Toole did from 2017 to 2020. Is it a bad time for the Conservatives right now? I think they're going to want a longer um, leadership race, but they can't. We have a minority government situation. I mean, Trudeau could go down on a vote of confidence, um, you know. Tomorrow. Sooner rather than later, yes. So then they are leaderless and their interim leader, you know, they, they maybe should be thinking about that when they're selecting their, their interim leader because that could be the person leading them into the next election. Uh, Dan, yourself on the same question, you you've seen the your party go through a leadership race, a long well. leadership race. Exactly. Uh, Did yeah, that make it better? Uh, I yes and no. Uh, it wasn't good for the party. I think it was good for the members. Uh, because they did have a chance to really test out all the leadership candidates uh, and coalesce around one of them. Uh, but it was horrific for the party. Uh, and again, this is where the interim leader matters, um, because fundraising for the party, uh, for the NDP, during our leadership race dried up. You didn't have Tom Mulcair going out into all the ridings fundraising and raising money, whereas Nicole Tournel in uh, 20, the end of 2011, uh, she did do that uh, to keep the money coming in and to keep uh, you know, the profile high and to keep things rolling. 
Um, so that's going to be a big question uh, with the Conservatives is whether or not all the money dries up. And I mean, don't forget, like you've still got Peter McKay who's got a half a million dollars of debt to pay off uh, that Stephen Harper was asking Conservatives for help with. Uh, and, you know, the Conservatives do tend to set large uh, limits for the amount of fundraising that can happen in a leadership. Uh, and again, in this pandemic and uh, with the potential for an election to come up, if all the money goes into the leadership, it's not going to go back into the party coffers uh, to fund that next election, uh, which, you know, and again, I'd say the liberals are probably looking at this and going, well, you know, we might want an election sooner rather than later. <laughs> um, but also, I think I think this gives actually Justin Trudeau an opportunity to go another term if he wants. Uh, you know, I think the folks were generally thinking, well, this will be his last hurrah. There will be a, an orderly succession that will take place. And, you know, you can keep the government rolling for, say, three years uh, to have a leadership race in two years and give a new prime minister a chance to get into the house and set their tone while also, uh, you know, setting a new bold agenda for the next election campaign. They might be going, well, you know what, we could get Trudeau a quick win, and then we've got four years to get that switched over and get a new leader in and do that. Uh, so I think it definitely changes the, the calculus. Uh, and really, even though the Liberals saw a drop in popularity this weekend, which not surprising given everything going on, uh, I think they're sitting back with the popcorn and just uh, chewing down and uh, watching this take place uh, with big smiles. Uh, I can only imagine the smile on Gerald Butt's face right now. Well, I mean, if we're talking, sorry, Chris, but if we're talking about sitting back, I mean, first of all, people say, why did Trudeau call that election? Actually, in hindsight, it's great because, uh, I mean, he's he's put the CPC in, in disarray and he, that wasn't his plan, but a uh, great outcome. And uh, who is there? Who's going to be their leader? Well, they, you know, already have their heir appoint. Uh, heir uh, apparent that everybody's talking about today and that's Pierre Pauly I never can I can't I don't like that man I just I don't know it by the way poil in French is is a hair that you don't find on your head oh (laughs) okay I mean thanks for keeping it PC Dan But I want to talk, you, you, oh, okay, now you've opened up the can of worms from Chris Brown's perspective. Whenever there's an heir apparent, that usually doesn't turn out well for the party. I go back to the 2011 uh, federal campaign when Michael Ignatieff was the heir apparent for that leadership, and he took that party and he destroyed it. I look here in Alberta, Jim Prentice, the heir apparent to uh, Allison Redford, he took the party and it went down to third party status. Is the heir apparent always a good thing or can it be a bad thing? Because we've seen in the past when you have a white knight coming in, riding in and on their steed, trying to save the party, it doesn't usually end up well for the party. Um, One quick point I want to make on that. Those are also both two instances where the caucus took matters into their own hands rather than the membership. Because with Ignatieff, it was the caucus that tossed out Dion and then anointed him they made him the leader right away and then it was just rubber stamped by convention afterwards uh and i'm sure jackie can talk more about uh the situation in alberta with prentice and uh with uh, allison redford too but you know sometimes the caucus needs to not doesn't get it right (laughs) more often than not how's that (laughs) but does the does the white knight syndrome the person who's going to save the party come back and bite the party in the ass from time to time because there could be other options where the party actually survives and rallies around the leader i I look at jason kenny the two parties merged under jason kenny and he came back and let's not talk about today let's talk about 2019 when he came back and he brought the conservatives back to power often than not it doesn't go well when the caucus interjects their will onto the party does it well, I, I don't think it does because they don't have the feel of what the general public are looking for or their membership are looking for because they, they do live under their own dome, as Ralph called it. But I mean, and, and frankly, for the conservatives, is there anyone in caucus that you think that should be 
that should be the leader, I think they'd be better served to get somebody from outside of caucus right now. Where's Rona? <laughs> and that I don't want to say anything bad about any of the potential candidates because I do want them to come on my show and talk about their leadership ambitions. So if you want to come on, please join us. Um, but let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about the potential candidates. Who are you looking at for this potential candidates? Because there's been a lot of talk on social media in the last 12 hours or 24 hours when this airs about we need a Western conservative leader because when you get someone from the GTA, it doesn't go well for the party. Or am I just out to lunch and Twitter is just a microcosm of what people actually want? Dan, who are you looking at for when the lead? I know you're an NDP supporter, so that's like asking a weird <laughs> question too. Who like, do I think would be good for us? <laughs> exactly. Who, do, uh, who is, I, who you is know the what? strong people and who are I the actually generally th speaking, think an Alberta conservative would be good for the NDP and the Liberals uh, in a general sense, um, because I think there is a bit of a divide these days between Alberta and the rest of the country. Um, but that being said, I, you know, is this the time for someone like Michelle Rempel to jump forward? Uh, you know, she's certainly polarizing within the party, uh, but, uh, you know, with some issues with respect to immigration notwithstanding, uh, she's somebody who on uh, women's issues, on same-sex marriage, on abortion, has views that could eat into the Liberal Party. Uh, so that's certainly something, someone to look at, and she certainly uh, has some strength. And, you know, she has the bona fides with respect to uh, guns and uh, the gun lobby within Canada and, and other strong conservative values. Uh, so, I mean, she would be a strong candidate, uh, and I mean, she'd get attacked like you wouldn't believe, uh, as unfortunately most women do. Um, but does uh, Leslin Lewis join the race again? The sort of the dark horse in the last election, and sort of the so, and she did do is, extremely is, well is, out west. I, I don't, is her debt paid off from the last campaign? I, I honestly don't know. Uh, she's somebody who certainly could come forward again. Uh, and she would be doing it from a much stronger position, actually being better known. Uh, but again, can she attract people from outside of that circle uh, that supported her in the last time? Is she somebody who brings some PPC supporters back in, perhaps? What about yourself, Jackie? Who are you looking at? And what areas of the pro uh, country are you looking at for potential leadership contenders to start coming out from? Well, I don't, I think that for the party, they shouldn't be focusing on the West. I think just as Dan said, that would be a, that would be a gift to the Liberals and the NDs at this point in time, because they're going to get the Alberta vote or it's going to go to the PPCs or the, the Maverick party. And it's going to be um, not enough to make a, a big difference. Uh, it's, they still out, uh, out um, number uh, the Liberals and the NDs significantly in almost every constituency. So, um, I think it, I really think it should be somebody to come from down East. I don't, I mean, Lisa Wright's name has been thrown out there. Um, can we, can we talk about Doug Ford for a second? We, Does, he's on my list. And that was a question <laughs> I was going to ask dad. I really wanted to know what his thought was on, on that. Uh, I'm going to throw out Brad Wall's name, who is a Westerner but potentially maybe someone. And he's already come out back. and said he doesn't want it. He has no interest of in getting back into politics. But Dan, Doug Ford has had the weirdest political journey that I've ever seen in my life. He's been a counselor. He, a failed mayoral candidate, randomly wins the leadership of the progressive conservatives because uh, Patrick Brown, which is another name that's been floated, yeah. mayor of Brampton, former progressive conservative leader. And Doug Ford's already said, he's potentially interested in taking over the federal conservatives. Does he potentially get into this? And does the fact that he doesn't know how to speak a lick of French matter anymore in politics federally? I, I think it'll, it'll matter to Quebec. I don't think it matters to the rest of the country. And, you know, that's one of the other divides. Uh, but I, I think they lose seats in Quebec with Doug Ford as leader. Uh, and, you know, one of my moments that I went a little bit crazy during the last uh, provincial election, uh, during the Northern Ontario debate, of course, Doug Ford was asked about French. He said, of course, I'm going to learn French. Not a problem. I'll, I'll first down the job. I'll start learning it. And, you know, we're many years past that and nothing's happened. 
Uh, meanwhile, of course, I went crazy because the the media reports were challenging Andrea Horvath's French, and it's like she spoke French, she spoke well. It was halting, but like this is Ontario, where it's not that big of a deal, and her French was better than everyone else's. But she took the critique. Um, but yeah, I mean, Doug Doug Ford, he can campaign, and he can talk to the every person, and you know, he he does big things terribly. And small things really well. Uh, I mean, you just look at uh, a few weeks ago when he was out shoveling snow for people during the big snowstorm in Toronto. You know, yes, on the macro level, he took a hit. Uh, but, you know, everybody, individuals sitting in their homes went, oh, yeah, there's the guy that's going to be there to help me as an individual. Uh, and that's really the, the Ford brand strength, Ford Nation. Uh, and I think that that would be attractive to people in Alberta. Mm-hmm. And I think it would be attractive to folks, uh, you know, on the prairies. Uh, I, I'm not sure how well it plays in Eastern Canada. Uh, but again, Eastern Canada, the Conservatives need to hold on to what they have. They don't necessarily need to grow there uh, in order to win government. So uh, and I'm, I'm not, to, not to interrupt here, but we do have. But he kind did of what the others values. couldn't do. Oh, sorry. Uh, so Candace Bergen has been appointed the interim leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. So Aaron O'Toole's deputy leader is taking over and moving into 24 Stornoway Drive here. Uh, So Candace Bergen, MP for uh, Manitoba, is now the leader. I just want to get your reaction to that because she is, speaking of someone who doesn't really know how to speak French, she is not well-versed in the French language. Is this going to bolster the support of Western Canada around the Conservative Party because now they have a Western MP as leader. Dan, we'll no. start with, oh, okay, okay. We'll start with Jackie. Nope, we'll start so, with Jackie. I don't think, Jackie. So. So, I don't think it's, I don't think it's gonna make a, a difference look. at all. So no. do you, what, what's your thoughts on Candace? Are, were you, are you surprised that they chose Candace? Because there was a list of candidates putting their name forward. Two MPs, Tom Kimmick uh, from Calgary Shepherd. And John Barlow, two Alberta MPs. Uh, there was two from New Brunswick, one from BC. Uh, Diane Finley, no Diane. Oh, that's uh, anyway. Diane what, Finley's not there anymore. No, Surrey White Rock, former uh, the current MP for Surrey White Rock. And I apologize for forgetting your name. But Jackie, what's your thoughts on uh, Candace Bergen being the new interim leader? Was it a smart move going with a woman against Justin Trudeau? Ah. Uh... Yes, <laughs> but not saying that. Not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying. No, I mean every always... interim leader of the Conservative Party has been a woman now. And uh, the last one did a very good job. People want her to come back and run. <laughs> so uh, actually, I'm surprised that Candace wouldn't put her name forward for the leadership race instead. But I guess maybe it's the whole French thing. So I have not been following who's put their names forward today because I actually had to work. Um, and uh, so I, I've only gotten snippets. And uh, so I'll, I'll read you the list of the official uh, candidates who put their name forward. John Barlow, Foothills MP, uh, Marilyn Gladue. Uh, I think she's from Ontario, if I'm not she, She's She's the, isn't she the former liberal who switched spots? Yes, I think so. Possibly. Think so. Uh, Tom Kamek, uh, Calgary Shepherd. To, uh, John Brassard. Uh, Carrie Lynn Finley. Carrie Lynn Finley is Surrey White Rock. Uh, John Williamson, within two seconds of the vote being announced that Aaron O'Toole was out, he posted on social media that he was running for the interim position. Rob Moore, uh, Royal Fundy in New Brunswick, and Candace Bergen was the other one. So Candace Bergen, deputy leader, has been named Manitoba's MP. Dan, so those uh, were my choices. So she did definitely her. Yeah. Uh, you, you've worked across the aisle from Candace there, Dan, what's your thoughts uh, on Candace? My, my very first in-person experience with Candace was, uh, in 2011, when she announced that she was changing her, her political name, uh, because she was no longer married and going back to her maiden name. And she said, made a joke and said, you know, I'm Candace Bergen, but not the actor. Um, Can- Candace, honestly, she's the right choice out of that list because she's the one with the biggest profile uh she maintained a high profile in the stephen harper government 
Uh, she's maintained a high profile and position under Andrew Shear and Aaron O'Toole. And of course, she was deputy leader. Um, and, you know, the only other one I would say that comes close in terms of profile there uh, would be John Williamson, but he carries more baggage, I would say, uh, than she does. Uh, so I think she she's the smart choice out of that list. Uh, I don't think she carries the party to new places, uh, but that's not what the interim leader is about. Candace Bergen, if she works hard and goes into ridings during the leadership race uh, to wave the flag and to fundraise, she will do quite well there. Uh, and she will do quite well at maintaining what the caucus has and certainly out of that majority of the caucus that voted Erin O'Toole out, uh, she's been the standard bearer already. Uh, and you just have to look at her speeches in the House of Commons uh, since Monday. Uh, she's kind of been the one at the front uh, of that movement. Uh, so yeah, she she's the right choice in that respect uh, and out of the candidates there, but uh, she doesn't take them to new places. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to Patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. So, uh, Jackie, I've got to ask this because you were in power when you had sort of an interim premier, which is kind of a weird statement, but it was a premier at the time. John Hancock, John Dave Hancock, Dave Hancock, not John Hancock's declar- signer of the Declaration of Independence, Dave Hancock. Um, that job is hard because you are now balancing an act of trying to keep the party unified while the party is getting divided by leadership contenders who are basically saying, you need to vote for me, you need to vote for me and don't worry about the party. I will fix it once I get in. How does she do it? And can you give sort of an example of how Dave was a uh, premier Hancock, I apologize, was able to keep the party united during a leadership race? Well, I always say that Dave Hancock was the best premier that we never elected uh, because he did an excellent, excellent job. And part of it was his love for people and he only wanted the best for the province. So he, he was willing to sit down with uh, members of the other parties. He was willing to sit down with, uh, uh, in our case, members of the caucus that perhaps didn't have an opportunity before to, to voice their opinion. He really, uh, I believe he had the right attitude and that was that was to uh, take this opportunity to uh, make Alberta better and make it better for Albertans. And uh, so, you know, if Candace has that same kind of attitude, though she's not, she's in the opposition, so it's slightly different. Yeah. Um, that, uh, yeah, she she just has to, to keep it afloat. I mean, I go back to my little stint at, my longer than expected stint as acting leader. I mean, your job is to uh, provide uh, a place for people to come, but you are only a caretaker until till the leader comes. And just as Dan was talking about fundraising, I think it was Dan or it was you, uh, people are always going, well, as soon as I know who the leader is, I will put in some dollars. So it's a, it's a position that you, you do have to park your ego be, uh, and I've said that twice tonight, something about an ego, which I don't know why I'm doing that, but you do have to park it because, oh, you're just the interim leader. <laughs> so, uh, you were you were there during the opposition years of the NDP, Dan. Um, untimely passing of uh, Jack Layton uh, sprung a leadership race for the NDP. Nicole, I forget, I, I, I apologize, I'm going to butcher her last name here you're going to say Nicole Turmel or Turmel. Nicole Turmel. Nicole Turmel. Is it smart of a party interim leader to come in and sort of clean the slate, set up their new own shadow cabinet, sort of talk about where the party needs to go? Or does the interim leader need to keep it as is? Don't ruffle any feathers that are in caucus because we know we have egos in caucus. I'm going to use a word here that Jackie's <laughs> been using, but can can Candace go in and change slate? And did Nicole do that as well? 
Nicole? Um, I I don't think changing slate is necessarily the right approach. I mean, there could be a time and a place where it would be, uh, you know, when everything has fallen apart and everybody's taken off, then, you know, you have to build up from, from scratch. In Nico's situation, because we had, like, we were not even <laughs> six months in yet, the leader of the, the, the office of the leader of the official opposition was still being built up. Uh, so Nicole just in that respect kept building it up in the same way uh, as Jack was going. Um, but the other thing there is you're going to be faced with changes because who are the people that generally jump into a leadership race? It's your French bench. Uh, when you're in government, uh, certainly some ministers are going to disappear, but the rest of the ministers stay around. So you still have that front, be front bench strength. When you're the interim leader in the opposition, this is when you have to start looking at your backbench and who can move up, who can move into the middle, who can move up into new positions when your finance critic disappears and jumps into the leadership race. Then you've got to move somebody else from the front bench there and then move somebody from the backbench into that person's position. Uh, so it's, it is definitely playing a little bit of chess. Uh, but you've really got to be looking at the backbench and seeing what kind of bench strength you have uh, to start bringing that forward, even if it's just in an interim basis. Uh, because, you know, you can't stop being the official opposition. Uh, and this is where this move just strikes me hard, because the Conservatives have been talking about the lack of government accountability for a long time now. And now they've just gone and blown up the official opposition and, you know, how are you supposed to hold the government to account when you're not paying attention to what's going on there? Uh, and that's going to make their job much more difficult in that respect. Uh, but yeah, moving people from the back to the front, uh, even if it's uh, temporary and short term, that's one of the things that the uh, interim leader has to work hard on. Uh, and it is a little bit different than when you're in government and that happens and in the opposition. So I'm just cautious of time here and we're coming up on the hour mark and I want to ask this final question and then we'll do a wrap up here is what's next? The age old question of Jeb Bartlett on the West Wing, what is next for this conservative party? We are seeing a more a move more to the right, which opens up the center for the Liberal Party and the NDP to potentially take over. We are seeing a more populist, and I, I hate to use this word, but more Trumpian sound bites that are coming out of some of the potential leadership candidates. What is next for the Conservative Party of Canada? We'll start with you, Jackie. Oh, well, I think um, I think they're going to try to to go forward because one of the statements I heard today was. Andrew Scheer was not the person to lead us into the next election. So that is, to me, that's where their focus is. And I think that uh, they will- You mean Aaron O'Toole? Sorry, Aaron O'Toole. Okay, I was like, Andrew <laughs> Scheer's back? What's this? <laughs> okay, about? Andrew Scheer was last time. I mean, this is history repeating itself in a way, but in a different fashion. Thank you, Deb. Thank you for saving me for that. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so- they're going to try to move. Aaron O'Toole was not the one to lead us, but they're going to try to win. And then I think it's after the win that they fall apart because now they have a common goal. Depends when that next election is called too. If they can keep it together that long. Dan, what about so. yourself? Where does the Conservative Party, what's next for the Conservative Party? I think it really depends on who they pick as leader, but I, if I had to make a bet on it, I think more years in the wilderness is where we're headed uh, for the Conservative Party. Um, I don't think it, they're in the next two to three years, they're going to come up with that cohesive winning strategy uh, and those values that enough Conservatives can get behind that's going to lead to victory. Uh, now, again, <sighs> You mentioned it, but Doug Ford, I mean, you know, there's, there's somebody who actually, if he jumped forward and won the leadership, uh, you know, he's well enough known that he could sneak out a win somehow. Uh, but I mean, that's terrifying because I just look at what's happening in Ontario and the response on COVID has just been atrocious. Come to Alberta. And Come to Alberta, <laughs> bud. Well, the, the, it I joke, but I should like, joke. <laughs> but the thing, the thing with Doug Ford, and you know, he is surprisingly responsive. But what's happened time and time again in Ontario is they've come forward, 
with a horrible plan. People have attacked it. It's been taken apart. And then 48 hours later, they completely reverse it, uh, which isn't a great style of leadership, but it's kept the conservatives in the mid thirties in Ontario. They have not lost uh, that core base of support that got them elected. Uh, and uh, you've got currently the Liberals and New Democrats fighting it out for second place. Um, so, I mean, he could get himself reelected in June. I think a lot of it has to depend on, on that. If he loses in June, is he then washed up? Uh, or if he wins in June, oh, that shouldn't have happened. That was my extra lights. <laughs> um, luckily, it's an LED one and it's pretty sturdy. Um, but yeah, so I mean, if he wins in June and then hands it off, uh, he could certainly be a, a surprise strong player in that conservative race. Uh, and, and I mean, that's just terrifying to me as a new Democrat, because, you know, even though we don't like the liberals, we think conservatives do worse things to the country. Uh, not all of them, Jackie, just some of them. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm interested. And this is my final word on this is if Doug Ford enters does Jason Kenney enter? I know he has no ambition, but Jason Kenney has always had an in, aspirations to be prime minister of Canada. I think everyone can admit to that right now who's sitting around this table. And if Jason Kenney enters, as, as Alberta goes, so does Saskatchewan, does Scott Moe then enter? And do we have the battle of the provinces of Ontario, Alberta, and Saskatchewan duking it out to say, hey, we handled the pandemic better than you guys did? Because that is my ultimate like fantasy of leadership races right now. Those three just going at it. And I, I, they probably won't, but that's where my that's where my ultimate fantasy of where the party is heading is a final royal rumble of the premiers of this country just getting together and just hashing it out. I well, see Kenny you all said, laughing at me. Kenny's, <laughs> Kenny, Kenny's, Kenny's got to survive a leadership review first, right? He's he said he's not running for the the federal. Okay, then let's put Brian Jean there because Brian Jean can't pass an election. He doesn't want to run it. Oh, well, he won't have the same. Uh, it, won't, it won't be the same because he didn't deal with the pandemic. And I don't think Scott Moe has the same ambition. So really... Um, Just Brad throw, Wall, so I throw think water, water on my dream. Wow. <laughs> uh, Brad Wall would be, I think, the better bet than Scott Moe. Uh, even if he said he, he's not interested in it. I think in, term, in conservative circles, he certainly is better known and well-respected and has a a record to run on whereas i don't think scott moe has a record to run on yet true he has brad wall's record and i i, I know scott moe i've interviewed him a few times back in Lloyd Minster, so uh good luck to any candidates but jackie dan i want to thank you so much for doing this last minute and sort of short notice and i'm so glad that we had this discussion because the next year is going to be interesting because we have a leadership race for the Conservatives. We have a leadership race for the Green Party of Canada. Uh, the NDP are fundraising or trying to fundraise for the next election, I'm assuming, because uh, I'm assuming they're in, uh, I, I saw the numbers, fundraising numbers out and it did not look well for the NDP. It did not look well for a lot of the parties, except the Liberals. They had more donations than the Conservatives this uh, quarter. So I don't know where the parties are going, but it's going to be an interesting year in federal politics. So I want to thank you both for doing this. Provincial too. We have elections in Ontario and, and Quebec. Some of the other pro and Quebec. Uh, and if if the NDP numbers aren't looking great federally, that's because all the money's going provincial, uh, where the Ontario NDP has broken all of their records. Uh, they raised money from over 123,000 Ontarians uh, yeah. last year. Uh, compared to 13,000 uh, people from the Conservatives and 2,500 from the Liberals, uh, yeah. you know, and they raised over five million dollars uh, in Ontario. I mean, that's that's incredible. Uh, so I think you know they're heading into a great position uh, provincially, uh, and I mean Quebec. It looks like Legault's going to win it again, uh, unless something really weird happens. And here in Alberta, we just had the numbers come out as well. And the NDP smashed all records, but also uh, the UCP was down and the Alberta party was up this year, this uh, quarter as well. So people are donating to parties. They're not donating federally, it seems. There, there's something to be said for sometimes holding on to your leader after an election, even when they were premier and lost. 
true. Um, thank you so much for both for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure uh, for everyone here at the Cross Border Interviews. Have yourself an excellent rest of your Thursday. Uh, I don't know why I'm saying this because you might not be listening to this on Thursday. So have an excellent rest of your day. And we will be back for another great episode sometime later. If you're listening to this, just click to the next episode. Uh, talk to you later, guys. And remember, guys, just keep talking. Just have a conversation and get off social media. For a